vaccinations are declining. Obviously, deaths are still on the upswing. Um, and if you uh, look in uh, West Virginia, we've had actually uh, more cases, not a big surprise over the weekend. So I think it, it depends where it is. I, I think one of the most interesting papers that came out this week is one that was done on the obstetrical service at Columbia. It was prompted by a um, woman coming in with some uh, upper respiratory symptoms who tested positive for COVID. And they said, my God, we should be looking at all our women coming in for delivery. And, and they did this. It was a two week period. And interestingly, 2% um, of women, and these were you know healthy young women coming in, just having their babies, uh, had respiratory symptoms that were positive for COVID, but 13%, 1-3% uh, were asymptomatic and had positive PCR for the virus of these young healthy women. So when we talk about new cases, uh, I think it's really perhaps just, you know, in West Virginia, by and large, not, not 100%, but we've been testing mostly symptomatic folks. And I think that, that, you know, sort of there's just emerging literature that there are a lot of folks that are asymptomatic. I don't know if others would, would care to uh, answer the beginning of the question about, you know, when is it safe to, to go back to ambulatory clinics, Chris? Um, I'm not aware of any specific guidance for, uh, for the outpatient setting. In the presentation, we will discuss uh, return to work for healthcare workers and many of the other issues, Sally, that you mentioned. Uh, there, are, there is some data coming out now that we continue to be surprised at how many people are out there uh, with antibody responses to the virus and surprising us. I don't see treatment uh, there in the question. There's reference to treatment. I don't see uh, treatment specific for this virus to be coming along um, and widespread available in, in the next several weeks. Um, but I do see that uh, testing issues are going to be critical, which we'll discuss in the presentation. Great. Thank you both. Um, if anybody has any further comment, you're, again, you're welcome to chat that in. So the next question. Um, is about the availability of diagnostic testing and turnaround time uh, it's going to take to get back to symptomatic patients. I don't know if there's been any further. Uh, I can address that. We'll be talking a lot about that in the, in the presentation. Uh, so uh, from a public health perspective, the lack of widespread availability, availability of testing is, to me, one of the single greatest uh, failures of many. Um, and uh, that is going to hopefully change soon. Uh, but as many people have used analogies of flying in the dark, if uh, we don't have uh, rapidly available widespread testing, we simply cannot get ahead of this pandemic. Um, and uh, I do believe that's going to be changing in the near future, as we'll discuss. Uh, turnaround time has also been an issue because uh, it's one thing to have the test, but if you don't get the results of the test reported back uh, to the appropriate um, agencies, public health people to take appropriate measures, it doesn't do you much good. So there's both a availability issue and a time aspect to this that we have struggled to date um, to respond to this. Great. That kind of goes right into the next thing. Um, and you may be talking about this as well. Do you foresee any role for the rapid IgG, IgM testing like Celex in the family practice clinic setting? The short answer is yes, I do. Uh, uh, yesterday, the FDA approved uh, three more similar tests to the Celex test. Others are available through the emergency use authorization. Um, there are important uh, uh, cautionary remarks to be made about the serological testing uh, that we'll discuss in the presentation. Uh, but definitely uh, a combination of uh, serological testing and uh, PCR-based testing is going to be critical as we begin to think about uh, moving into what's been referred to as phase two uh, beyond the current um, unsustainable measures that we're taking. These are unsustainable from an economic point of view. Having all of us um, at home all the time um, it cannot be sustained indefinitely. So we are now thinking about how do we move to the next phase of uh, progressively, not, of course, uh, uh, this isn't going to change suddenly, but through a phased approach, beginning to relax some of these 
and testing is going to be uh, both serological point of contact testing and PCR testing, which can also be point of contact, um, is going to play an important role in guiding those efforts. But many issues need to be resolved as we're uh, implementing those testing and uh, scaling it up. Perfect. Um, okay, so the next two questions are about masks, N95 specifically. So if an N95 mask is not compromised, how many times would you recommend reusing? Um, let's see. People are being told to cover with a regular surgical mask to last longer. Um, what would you recommend? So since I'm occupational medicine and we, we do all the fit testing for WVU medicine, uh, I'll, I'll chime in and the clinicians may want to add some additional comments. The, the CDC uh, has very good uh, guidance on uh, two approaches that we're using. So the first comment to make is that uh, this is not standard care. Uh, uh, six months ago, the concept of uh, prolonged use or reuse of N95 masks in the clinical setting would, would horrify my infectious disease colleagues and, and appropriately so. So we are now dealing with a, a uh, non-standard clinical care. So obviously if you don't have to use them for prolonged periods of time and you don't have to reuse them, the standard of care is not to do either of those things. But we do need to distinguish between prolonged use and reuse. Uh, the CDC guidance clearly states that they prefer prolonged use uh, over, over reuse. So if you can continue to wear the N95 mask, that's preferable to multiply, multiple occasions of uh, donning and doffing the same mask. So the key thing to understand about this is uh, you've heard many times everybody on this uh, Zoom, don't touch your face, don't touch your face. I'll provide a variation on that don't touch your N95, don't touch your N95. And for all the same re reasons that we don't want you to touch your face, we don't want you touching your N95 uh, mask. So the CDC document says uh, it's really impossible to give you a clear number of how many times you can reuse it. Uh, prolonged use is better. And prolonged use is not going to be according to a fixed duration. Rather, the individual is going to have to, uh, you know, take a break to eat, can't tolerate the N95. And that's in all likelihood going to be the limiting factor uh, to prolonged use. And uh, you stop using it when it becomes compromised, uh, you know, through, uh, through contact. Uh, under the specific, uh, specific scenario described, uh, uh, I, I would prefer other measures uh, to wearing a surgical mask over an N95. Uh, one reason for that is, again, I'm trying to visualize that first of all, and can envision a lot of rearranging and contacting, and we, we don't want people touching and potentially contaminating their, uh, their mask or their respirator. Um, and secondly, uh, we want everyone to be as efficient as they possibly can in the use of all uh, PPE. And so now you're using both a surgical mask and an N95. Um, uh, one suggestion I would have under that scenario, would it be possible to use a face shield, which can be uh, washed and, and sterilized, uh, to offer the protection over the N95 versus a surgical mask. Uh, that way you can at least save some of the surgical masks would be my uh, thoughts on that question. And, and maybe our clinicians want to add additional ones. Oh, and storage, it can be stored in a, in a paper bag. Um, just to add to that, there was, uh, there's a paper coming out from the Rocky Mountain Lab, which is, um, an NIH lab uh, dealing with pathogens. We talked a little bit about decontamination of N95s, um, and they looked at four methods. One was uh, spraying ethanol, alcohol, on the um, N95, and they found that really that um, precluded good fit and was not recommended. Uh, there were three methods that uh, fared better. Or one was uh, the UV uh, radiation, uh, one was heat, and one was the hydrogen peroxide vapor. Uh, the, the latter was actually, you know, the integrity of that mask lasted for uh, three times. There's ongoing work at WVU on the uh, vaporized uh, hydrogen peroxide um, ongoing now. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I agree with everything Chris said and, and sort of this decontamination issue, I, I think people were, you know, spraying alcohol and thinking that works, and it, it really uh, should not be recommended. 
the other thing is, is I think that there have been, particularly in West Virginia, you know, sort of several initiatives that have resulted, and I don't know, maybe Chris wants to comment on this or others, with, you know, uh, getting uh, additional supplies of N95s, uh, and hopefully that will continue to improve. Perfect. That actually goes right into the next question, which was about using uh, UV light to sanitize. So perfect. Thank you. Um, so next question, uh, Dr. Martin, you may touch on this as well, but um, is there any protocol in place for testing after a positive result? Uh, so I, I think when, you, when we're dealing with issues of testing, I go, I go back to what I learned in medical school, which is what am I going to do with the result? So it is, is uh, and I think the question was after someone has tested positive, is there any point in retesting them? Um, so for healthcare workers, uh, there, there's a clear protocol that we'll discuss in the presentation of, of repeat testing. Uh, the short answer being uh, we want two negative tests greater than 24 hours apart um, on the PCR based assay. Um, otherwise, you have to think about what, what it, is it going to change anything? Um, and, and that would be in one case guided by, by clinical uh, pictures, but uh, discussing this earlier with Dr. Fisher, um, you know, patients are managed clinically that are admitted uh, for, with COVID-19 um, and they are, they're not, you know, they're not retesting them to determine that they have a negative result. Um, and then in, in terms of other clinical considerations, is it going to change uh, how that person is going to behave? Uh, of course, we're all at home. Uh, we're all uh, in Mon County. We're in a, uh, in a hotspot. Um, so we're, uh, we're at home, we're trying to minimize these. Are, are, is anything going to change beyond what we're all required to do right now? So I'm not aware of any specific protocol on, uh, in terms of following up a positive test result. I think that should be guided um, on an individual basis based on either clinical considerations or how you might manage that individual's behavior with clear guidance really only being available, to my knowledge, for healthcare workers and return to work. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, Caitlin, could I just go back to the question on UV re radiation? You know, these are really specific protocols. It's not like just putting your N95 out in the sun. And I just wanted to make that clear. For the UV radiation question, there's a, a protocol from the University of Nebraska that they've been using that, that is validated that is on their website. But I just, you know, it's, it's not something you just put it out in some sunlight and assume that it works. Thank you. And we can send that out to everybody to make sure they have it. Um, great. Uh, so our next question is, uh, is a little vague, but any thoughts on herd immunity for, from all of this? Well, si since I'm an epidemiology guy, I, I love herd immunity. So I certainly welcome that question. And, and uh, we're going to talk about that in the presentation. Um, and all I'll say at this point is just to remind everyone that, that herd immunity is the protection that the entire population gets uh, from having a sufficiently high proportion of that population immune. And of course, there are two ways that that immunity can be acquired, either through natural infection, which is at the moment the only available way to become immune to the SARS-CoV-2 virus is to have the infection, whether or not you have symptoms. We hope that a vaccine um, is on the way. Uh, quite frankly, I think, uh, my own personal opinion is a vaccine may become available and for widespread use um, 18 months from now. Uh, we're currently in phase one studies. They are recruiting individuals. They started recruiting them last month. That uh, um, I, I believe is a, at least in um, a, a 12 month study, if not longer. And phase one studies only demonstrate, uh, are, are primarily intended to demonstrate efficacy, excuse me, safety rather than efficacy. So once you've shown that it's safe in humans, then you've got to repeat these studies to demonstrate efficacy, and then you've got to scale it up. So uh, herd immunity is, 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 is a critical concept from uh, a public health perspective, and we'll be addressing it in the presentation um, and it, for, for, for further information. And, and so it's an excellent question, and we will get to it. Perfect. Um... And so our final question, yay, I'm so glad to have gotten through all of those that we had backed up. Um, can anyone speak about shedding COVID after recovery? Are you still able to spread it? 
Uh, that we'll also talk about in the presentation. So uh, under testing, uh, the, the basic testing right now is uh, essentially looking for fragments of the RNA that the virus, that is the genetic material of the virus. That um, is not synonymous with transmissibility. So the short answer is we do not know what it means when an individual, particularly uh, an individual recovering from this infection or who has recovered, can use to test positive by the PCR-based assay. We, the short answer is we do not know what that means for transmissibility, but you cannot equate uh, a positive PCR test with the presence of viable viruses. So we do know for other infections, and I remember as a medical student with, with TB, uh, sim, you, know, you can continue to uh, isolate the organism, and in some cases that doesn't necessarily mean transmissibility. So the short answer is, we are seeing prolonged uh, evidence of uh, positive PCR tests. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we do not know what that means for transmissibility. Great, thank you. So that was our queued up questions, everybody. If you have more questions, you're welcome to chat them in and we will get to them after the presentation. Um, but Dr. Martin, are you ready if I share your, your slides? I am. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, uh, for joining us, and a particular thank you to all the people behind ECHO. Uh, ECHO is certainly one of those resources that you're so very grateful for um, being in place long before this happened and helping us share a lot of information and feeling connected in these unprecedented times. So thank you for inviting me. I'm gonna be talking about testing this afternoon. It's gonna be about a 20-minute presentation, hopefully, and try and cover the essentials. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the broad types of testing uh, for this virus, uh, talk a lot about the PCR assay as we've already continued to do, uh, addressing issues of who should be tested according to uh, the latest CDC recommendations, address issues of return to work for healthcare workers, review some of the test results uh, in our state, uh, and then move towards serological testing, which again, as we've already discussed, is going to, I see, play an increasing role moving forward. Uh, the wonderful question about herd immunity, and uh, talk about uh, what we can expect, hopefully, with future test availability and reopening and coming back to uh, more normal lives. Next slide, please. I, I start all my coronavirus presentation with my caveat. I, I could add that I have no financial uh, disclosures or conflicts to disclose, but I do have many other uh, internal conflicts, uh, and they relate to the fact that this virus has only been present for four months. This is an entirely novel infection. And my goodness, the, uh, the flood of information that I am struggling to keep up with that is so rapidly changing. As a result, uh, in this presentation, I will rely on sources that I would never normally rely on, uh, media reports, uh, papers that uh, are in peer review that have not yet been uh, accepted for publication, uh, et cetera. And I will have to ask for your forgiveness because some of the data, given how fast this is moving, is already out of date. And of course, I may say things in this presentation that are, are subsequently found to be um, incorrect, perhaps, as we get new knowledge. So please forgive me. Thankfully, we had a, have a lot of people on this Zoom call who are very knowledgeable. That also means they have free license to chime in and correct me or add updated information as we uh, move to the Q&A session. Next slide, please. In terms of the, the broad types, the way that I conceptualize this uh, for this virus is there are, there are three broad types. Uh, the first are so-called nucleic acid amplification, also known as molecular uh, tests. What these are assessing um, is the genetic material of the pathogen. And these have been around for a long time. PCR uh, was invented in 1983. This is the same way that we test for other uh, pathogens. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus, so essentially this involves extracting the RNA from a biological specimen, using the reverse transcriptase enzyme to create a, a cDNA from that RNA, and then using the PCR test to amplify uh, greatly that cDNA. Uh, the, the way to understand this is, this is, uh, should be understood to measure the presence of viral RNA. As I said earlier, that's different than viable virus. Um, this is simply, you are detecting the genetic material, uh, but what that means in terms of transmissibility at this point is uncertain and unknown. 
the second group of testing, uh, that, which is not yet widely available, but I see that becoming more uh, uh, widely available and important as we move forward, are the so-called serological, also known as antibody-based testing. Most of these are detecting antibodies uh, made in response to the antigen of the virus. So an individual becomes infected with the virus, the body mounts a response and produces antibodies. Uh, specifically, most of the tests are looking at a nucleoprotein. The two key antibodies that are being tested are IgM and IgG. IgM being the first one to appear on, uh, with a median of five days, uh, a range of three to six days after symptom onset. IgG takes a little bit longer, uh, a median of 14 days with a range of 10 to 18 days after symptom onset. So that's very important. These are not uh, test results that provide um, a, immediate uh, results or, or immediate positivity with infection. The best way to understand them is they measure uh, past exposure uh, to virus. And we'll talk about what that means, but uh, strictly speaking, that's all you should interpret from a positive serological test uh, to this virus. The third that I'm going to mention, which is not uh, for, for clinical use and not routinely recommended, are um, isolation and culture, these traditional techniques that are available for uh, many uh, pathogens. Of course, it's not routinely recommended because we're dealing with a pandemic precisely because of this virus. And so it would, be, uh, would require special precautions and a biosafety level three lab, which we do have at the Health Sciences Center. But I'm gonna to refer to it in the presentation and it's best uh, to think about this as a good measure of the transmissibility of the virus. And so I will be talking about it in that context. Next slide, please. And of course, the first two, uh, the, the, uh, the PCR-based assay and the future availability of serological tests can also be performed as so-called point of care or contact uh, testing. That essentially involves the same methodologies, but automating it um, and putting it out in the field. In this case, results can be available uh, within minutes. And of course, as a public health provider, that rapid turnaround is critically important as we try and get ahead of this virus. Uh, the PCR assay uh, is, as I mentioned, the only uh, test that we have currently that's widely available, and it measures the, the viral RNA, not viable virus, so we cannot equate it with transmissibility uh, of the infection. The CDC prefers that a nasopharyngeal swab be taken, and uh, any of you in the, in the clinical context, uh, this is familiar to you, but if you're not, I just want to show a picture here of an individual undergoing a nasopharyngeal swab from a video that the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, that swab goes back uh, two to three inches and has to be uh, turned around for 10 to 15 seconds. It's unpleasant, it's not painful. Um, but I show that to illustrate that there is uh, some technique to this. It has to be performed by a healthcare professional. And that therefore means that the healthcare professional has to be in full appropriate PPE, which is in uh, short supply. Uh, but that this is not simply, uh, you know, a swab a Q-tip in your nose. The, the test collection is important. And one of the reasons that you might get a, a falsely negative test result is simply that the specimen wasn't corrected, uh, collected properly. The CDC also indicates that if there are, uh, uh, if you can collect specimens from the lower respiratory tract, so the individual is producing sputum, et cetera, then those should be tested as well. Oropharyngeal swabs, uh, swabs of the nares or the mid turbinates um, are, are also uh, possible but not preferred as the NP swab is. Um, the PCR test is simply reported as detected or not detected. However, it is a semi-quantitative test. In other words, the lab is actually measuring the amount of RNA present, which gives you some indication of viral load, uh, but that is currently not reported back and not uh, used uh, clinically. And there's more information in the link below about some of the details of specimen collection um, and laboratory issues. Next slide, please. Uh, who should be tested? Well, uh, not project very well, uh, but the CDC essentially has uh, uh, three priority groups. Priority one group being um, healthcare workers with symptoms and uh, individuals hospitalized uh, with symptoms. Uh, the, the groups go down into different priorities, but the vast majority of individuals that are being tested at this point uh, or prioritized for testing are symptomatic uh, individuals. And I'd refer you to the website for uh, 
information on uh, who should be testing. Um, at WVU Medicine, certainly again, they're, they're testing in-house uh, three times a day. Uh, who are admitted or going to be admitted to the hospital and healthcare workers. There are also mobile units that are available from both WVU Medicine and Mon Health. Uh, again, those require a physician order and the priority is to be uh, symptomatic and meeting symptomatic criteria before you show up at those uh, with physician order for testing. That's going to be an important point that I'm going to come back to later on. Next slide, please. Uh, if, if you haven't already read it, the National Academy of Science uh, issued a document, the link is here, which is an excellent summary of, of some of the limitations right now uh, in, in testing both. Then they address both PCR assay and also talk about culture results because of what it tells us about this infection. Um, and so the next uh, two slides are going to quote extensively from that document, which uh, it's only a few pages, uh, and I highly recommend that you read that as well. Uh, they report that viral shedding of the organism is, quote, not uncommon two to three days before symptom onset. And this, of course, has huge implications for transmission um, and is one of the reasons, uh, I believe, that we've had this disease spreading through the community in, in ways that we haven't appreciated because people are shedding viruses bef uh, before they become symptomatic themselves. Initially, it was thought that that was rare, um, and that is, is no longer the case. Um, also, when you move into that symptomatic phase, viral loads tend to be very uh, high or early on. Again, this is, uh, makes it very transmissible within a population when people are able to spread the disease very, very early on uh, in their symptomatic period. So when you think about making behavioral modifications and staying home, um, again, these two factors are working against us. More severe clinical disease is associated with a longer uh, persistence of the viral RNA shedding. And as I mentioned, uh, we now know that many cases have persistent viral RNA shedding. Uh, it's not uncommon for that to be uh, for up to a week after resolution of symptoms. And there's a case report of an individual uh, shedding the virus for 49 days after recovery of symptoms. Again, we don't entirely know what that means in terms of your risk of transmission of the disease. Next slide. Um, in addition, uh, viral RNA has been isolated from stool, anal swabs, and other uh, specimens, and that seems to persist longer than samples taken from the respiratory tract. Again, the role in transmission and whether there is fecal-oral transmission um, or, or other transmissions involving this route of exposure are currently unknown. Other body fluids that have been tested listed here uh, seem to usually be negative, but again, we're not at the point where we can counsel patients um, as to whether or not, for example, this could also be transmitted uh, through sex. Next slide, please. Additional gaps in knowledge. We don't know the effect of treatment on this prolonged shedding. Uh, we don't know, as I've mentioned several times, uh, what the relationship is between transmissibility and positive PCR tests, uh, what the significance of those individuals who have prolonged viral RNA shedding after they recover, um, the importance of those other sites, particularly uh, GI, and uh, we do not yet have innovative assays that address the shortcoming of PCR and tell us if the virus continues to be infectious. Next slide. So uh, turning now to uh, return to work issues, the CDC just updated on April 13th uh, some of their guidance for return to healthcare workers. The link is provided for you here. Um, at that time, they indicated that they now uh, clearly prefer a test-based strategy, uh, which I'll outline for you here. And that is healthcare workers should be excluded from work until, and I, I want to emphasize that these are ands, and so all three of these conditions have to be met uh, for return to work of a healthcare provider, resolution of fever without the use of medications, improvement in symptoms, and as I mentioned earlier, two negative PCR results from nasopharyngeal swabs uh, taken greater than 24 hours apart. That is now the preferred strategy of CDC. Uh, next slide, please. A less preferred strategy if testing availability is a problem is to exclude from work. And again, uh, all three of these conditions have to be met. At least three days have passed since recovery uh, with defined as resolution of fever without meds, improvement in respiratory symptoms, and at least seven days have passed since symptom onset. 
Um, of course, we now recognize that there are large numbers of asymptomatic infections, as uh, Dr. Hodder mentioned. Um, and a healthcare worker who never develops symptoms is excluded from work until, until 10 days have passed since the first positive test. Um, there are additional recommendations for what the healthcare worker should be doing once they return to work, and I'd refer you to that link for some of the additional details. Next slide. So turning now to some of the test results in West Virginia, uh, like uh, if you're like me, you've been going to this website uh, very frequently. Um, and this is a, a screenshot that I took uh, yesterday evening, and it's already out of date. Uh, at, at that time, we had tested uh, 17,821 individuals with 718 positive tests. And note that we're consistently running around 4% and have done so, uh, you know, it, it's creeping up a little bit, but it's been three and a half, four 4% uh, now for a couple of weeks. Um, the reason I show this data is to emphasize that given what I said earlier, that we're largely testing symptomatic individuals, I think it's important for all clinicians to remember that most of the people that are, have symptoms that are compatible with COVID-19 actually test negative. Um, only 4% of them are testing positive. And so uh, bear in mind that we still have influenza, we still have RSV, we still have all of those other viruses. Um, and I find a, a lot of patients are reassured when you tell them, you know, um, only 4% cumulatively, cumulatively of people have uh, turned out to have uh, this particular virus. So we shouldn't forget those other pathogens. Uh, next slide, please. This is data that I graphed, so please treat it with some uh, uh, skepticism or, or, or critical eye. Um, the uh, DHHR stopped reporting the new cases uh, on April 8th. Um, so up until April 8th, this is from the DHHR daily reports on the number of new cases. After that, I relied on data from a press conference that Governor Justice gave where he verbally conveyed some of the number of new cases. The dates that he was providing didn't line up with the prior DHHR reports. So this could be shifted off by a day, but I believe the overall shape of the curve is correct. Um, and of course, uh, what we're all hoping for is that, uh, you know, we've crested the wave, but uh, Dr. Hodder mentioned um, a spike in cases over the weekend. Um, and I haven't seen today's data yet. But speaking as, a, as an epidemiologist, uh, these are relatively small numbers and it isn't gonna take much to, to shift this in any direction. So um, it's unclear you know, uh, what the overall trend is based on these small numbers. It does appear to be encouraging. It wouldn't take much to change this situation dramatically. Um, and this is important as we think about reopening. Uh, the guidance that we're uh, following is that 14 days of a sustained reduction in community transmission. So we would, we would not really factor in localized outbreaks, but begin to consider relaxing some of these broad restrictions after about two weeks of sustained reductions in community cases. Uh, next slide, please. Turning now to serological testing, the single most important point about serological testing is it must not be used to diagnose infection. Uh, the most important reason why that's true is it takes days for you to develop a response. We'll see that there are other problems, but uh, this is not a diagnosis of infection. Uh, this is a, a, a marker of past exposure to the viral pathogen. It's also important to remember that um, antibodies are not synonymous with immunity. Uh, and uh, especially with Dr. Hodder on the Zoom, I hesitate to even go here and talk about HIV, but HIV would be an example of an infection for which you can produce a, an abundant antibody response and that does not confer immunity uh, to that infection. So we know that infectious diseases exist along a continuum where in some cases, antibody responses are reliable indicators of immunity, but there are many others where it, it is not associated with immunity. And we don't know uh, what the status is for this particular pathogen. However, serological testing is gonna be absolutely critical for judging the uh, efficacy of any future vaccines, for guiding epidemiologic studies, including outbreak investigations and contact tracing to determine levels of herd immunity and to guide our efforts to reopen and move beyond the phase that we're in now. Next slide, please. There have been problems with serological testing. So the FDA eased up some of its oversight under these circumstances and uh, led to a flood of uh, unvalidated tests that were providing poor results. The CEO of the Association of the Public 
health laboratories described the situation with the technical term saying that these tests were, quote, crappy. Um, his use of words, not mine, but uh, major problems. Uh, beyond those sort of test methodological problems and problems with uh, validation, there are some general problems with serological testing. Uh, one would be false positive. So this would be an example where the serological testing suggests that you have antibodies, but you don't really have protection against the disease. That might exist because you actually had past exposure to other human coronaviruses. So we know that there are uh, several human coronaviruses that are the second most common cause of the, of the common cold. Uh, they widely circulate, um, and some of these tests were cross-reacting with those uh, viruses, not SARS-CoV-2. Um, in addition, uh, I teach medical students the two-by-two -two table, and I saw from the chat some of my former students are, are on the Zoom, and so this is probably going to make them shudder, but we talk about the two-by-two -two table, uh, sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive value, if you run the numbers uh, for, for this test and COVID-19, uh, Dr. Burks has said that her expectation is the sensitivity be at least 90%. So if you take a sensitivity of 90% for these tests and say assume a prevalence of 1% of, of COVID-19 um, and you run that in a two by two table, most of your test results are gonna be wrong uh, for the very simple reason that um, there just isn't a lot of disease in the population that you're testing. Um, and so that's a general problem with these uh, tests, which might be addressed if you improve some of the parameters, but you're still gonna be left with a relatively low prevalence of disease. Remember, 4% of those that we tested positive, and as we begin to uh, move out beyond testing symptomatic individuals, the pretest likelihood of disease is going to be low. On the other hand, you can also have false negatives uh, if you perform the test too early before the antibody response has been elicited. And a uh, paper has come out from China, which is uh, under peer review. They studied 175 patients hospitalized with what they called mild disease. Now I caution you, our experience with reading the Chinese literature is what they call mild is actually, we would call more severe. Uh, nonetheless, these were people who were hospitalized. Uh, right there, I would question the term mild. None of them were in the ICU. Uh, they were admitted for an average of 16 days. At discharge, 30% had low levels of antibodies, and more troubling, 6% had undetectable. So these are recovered cases of COVID-19 uh, with 6% um, undetectable antibody levels. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at st uh, studies from SARS-CoV, the 2002-2003 epidemic, uh, MERS-CoV from 2012, that's in the, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, they indicate that there is no durable antibody response. But what that really means is there's no response beyond about two to three years. Um, and as others have pointed out, uh, two to three years of immunity would be absolutely wonderful because that would give us time to develop uh, treatments and uh, a vaccine. Uh, but it does not appear that related uh, uh, from the zoonotic coronavirus is closely related to this one, uh, that you get a, a durable or lifelong um, immune response. And of course, we've already discussed this, and Dr. Hodder mentioned a, a study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine on April 13th. The key question is, how many cases are we missing? Uh, similar to the study she mentioned, uh, there's a German language study, uh, which uh, for those of you who read German, of which, of which I'm not among you, uh, the link is provided below, um, and they were, found similar results. So in, in situations where you go out into these hotspots, and you start doing population-based uh, zero surveys, just start testing everybody, which is beginning to be done both in the United States and around the world, uh, we're surprised at how many people have antibodies uh, who were, had no recollection of disease. The German study reported a similar figure of 14%. So that's probably some good news. Uh, it might be even higher. Obviously, the higher that number is, the better uh, the news from a public health perspective and moving forward is. It means we're closer to herd immunity, it also means case fatality rates are a lot lower because that's the denominator of that calculation. But that's the good news. The bad news is uh, herd immunity that we defined earlier is really driven by how contagious the virus uh, or, or the pathogen is. And in epidemiology, we measure that through something called the basic reproductive number or R0. Um, so more contagious infections of which the prototype would be measles, uh, you need about 90% immune in the population to achieve uh, herd immunity. Uh, for influenza, it's about 25%, simply because it's not as contagious. 
So if you estimate a, a basic reproductive number of SARS-CoV-2 of between two to three, uh, that would mean that herd immunity would begin around 50% to 70%. And of course, when you uh, acquire this through natural infection, that means a lot of people are gonna die. So that comes at a price because uh, people are gonna have serious infections, some of them will die. So herd immunity is the ultimate solution to this problem, but uh, without a vaccine, we would pay a heavy price to acquire it naturally. Next slide, please. So uh, finally, some issues on future test availability. Uh, I, I consulted uh, uh, Russian nobility on this one and was advised that we can hopefully expect high capacity testing in about two weeks. That would be laboratory-based testing, uh, point of contact testing, hopefully in one to two months. Um, as I mentioned, reopening is going to involve a, an incremental approach of loosening progressive restrictions and testing it under everybody's thinking is going to uh, play a big part of that. If you haven't also read Scott Gottlieb, uh, his uh, proposal to reopen the country, the link is there. He discusses some of these issues. I would also point out that if you combine PCR testing and serological testing, as some have advocated, you, you would get better test performance by combining the tests together. And I certainly think that that combination is gonna play a key role in guiding us uh, moving forward. Uh, Scott Gottlieb and, and his group uh, estimated 750,000 tests needed per week nationally. So if you extrapolate that to West Virginia, that would be about 4,000 per week. Uh, looking at the DHHR data, uh, it seems as if we reported about 3,200 tests in the last week. Uh, so we're not too far off uh, where we'd need to be. And finally, um, as, a, as a Canadian, uh, I was really, my heart was warmed when Tony Fauci mentioned in, on March 10th, um, he used a Wayne Gretzky metaphor, and every Canadian knows that Wayne Gretzky was the best hockey player because while good hockey players went where the puck was, uh, Wayne Gretzky was unique in his ability to go to where the puck was going to be. I think that's a really profound comment. Uh, what I see so far is that we are unable to coordinate, we're unable to move rapidly. We have the technology, and we can find out really interesting things. So we had uh, PCR testing for this virus in early January. Um, we are able to reconstruct the New York outbreak and understand that it was seeded from Europe, studying the mutation of the virus through populations. We've got incredible tools that we can use. The problem is the information is coming too late. Um, so we really need to do a much better job of getting this much more rapidly tested, much more rapidly reported, taking appropriate action uh, if we're going to turn the tide on this infection. Uh, final slide, please. And so lastly, uh, my, my daughter uh, got married in, uh, um, had, had a wonderful marriage in, um, in August, a uh, wonderful wedding, and then was thrilled to move to Northern Italy, uh, and unfortunately has been quarantined for three weeks longer than I have. Uh, but she uh, showed me these, these pictures, uh, the rainbows, which have now taken off all over the world, started in Italy. And so children started putting these up all over, the, uh, all over her town. And she took a picture uh, in Italian, it says tutto andrà bene, which in English lower down means everything is going to be all right. So I know I've given you some uh, doom and gloom, but uh, I do believe that better days are ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, you've got a bunch of wonderful positive comments over in the chat. Uh, and we do have questions, I'm gonna try to read them as eloquently as I can. Um, let's see. Uh, going up, as a requisite for testing with any condition, uh, taught by Dr. Martin himself, that we always maximize the pretest likelihood of disease for any test. Uh, let's see, I have trouble understanding how this is different as we are able to move to testing based on serological testing in this case. Uh, what I'm asking, what are we going to do with results as we understand that the pretest likelihood of the disease is low? Yeah, I love those questions from my former students, um, but they're tough questions. Uh, so I think, uh, first of all, in, in terms of the serological testing, a lot of work needs to be done to validate it because we actually don't know what the sensitivity and specificity is um, in, in the real world. Um, so those have not yet been clarified. And so, uh, you know, somebody I was reading earlier described these serological tests as still in their infancy. So um, it, it's one thing to do the tests and it's, it's another to know what it means. In terms of targeting testing, I think the, uh, 
I recently read a book on, on smallpox eradication. And what was really interesting about smallpox eradication, we never seemed to learn these lessons. Uh, when that effort was being led, the thought was that this was impossible. You could never eradicate an infectious disease because you'd have to vaccinate everybody in the world, and that was impossible. The reason that was false was because you don't have to vaccinate everybody in the world. Uh, you, you have to target it, and you have to have, uh, as important as the availability of a vaccine, is the surveillance system. And so when you read the history of how we eradicated smallpox, we eradicated it by having very uh, robust, timely surveillance systems. And so when a case popped up in some village in Brazil, we were able to swoop in very quickly and apply a ring treatment and get everybody around it and prevent it from getting out. So I think, uh, you know, Dr. Marsh uses this term moving from a, from a hammer to a scalpel. Uh, right now we're in the hammer phase where we're all at home and we don't know what's going on. We don't have test results, but uh, targeted testing to get at this question to maximize the pretest likelihood of disease would mean that uh, you have very rapidly available PCR based testing of, of close contacts of an identified case that you're able to quickly go in um, and take appropriate measures. So more targeted testing um, I think would be very valuable. With serological testing, we're, we're further behind. We need a lot of work to do to even clarify the sensitivity and specificity before we begin to think about um, how we can perform this test and how we target it. Perfect, thank you. Dr. Hodder, did you have any comment? No, no, that's terrific. And thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was great. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, next question, is there any plan to use the saliva test that was recently approved by the FDA? Uh, I'm, I'm glad I provided the caveat. I am not familiar with the saliva test. If anyone else is... Well, I'm not familiar either, but, but uh, you know, I think Chris really clearly the um, FDA really has these authorizations for these new tests, but I think many of them you know, for all the reasons he mentioned, we really don't have thorough understanding as we would in a situation where, you know, these were tried much more thoroughly. Um, they have described a saliva test. They say, you know, that it is uh, quite good, but I think that there really needs to be more data. At least that's my take on very preliminary stuff that I've read. Perfect, thank you both. Um, let's see. There have been recent reports of reinfection in patients in South Korea. Has there been any verification for any of these reports? Um, and if those patients are actually able to continue spreading the disease? Uh, that, that's an excellent question. And actually I was at one point going to include that, uh, but the presentation was getting too long. So on April 10th, uh, the Korean CDC reported, uh, and I just want to clarify from the question, not necessarily reinfection, but individuals who had tested negative and then appeared to be testing positive. Um, they, I, I checked the Korean CDC website yesterday to see if there was any updated information on that. Uh, there was not. So those individuals are being investigated to see if this was a specimen collection issue. Remember the, the nasopharyngeal swab is, you know, has to be done technically correct. Uh, was the viral media, was storage, all of those issues. Um, the thinking now is that um, th this is not a reinfection. So in other words, it's not a, that the person is now going through a, a, a new infection. Um, it might be uh, technical issues related to an earlier false negative result, or some have speculated as to maybe the, the, you know, the virus is becoming somewhat reactivated, whatever that means, but you're, you're seeing a resurgence in, in the viral RNA. But um, as of yesterday, that, that is correct, 91 cases um, and, and, but as yet, we don't have any uh, results as to what the investigations to follow up to determine why that happened. Thank you. Um, so we had a question. This one, this question is coming out of Mon County, um, but also for all the other counties, if you guys have similar uh, question, we can try to get that answer. Do the testing sites in Mon County have the necessary pieces for testing um, media swabs and reagents? 
Uh, I asked that question of Dr. Fisher in, in the inpatient setting. Uh, it, it seems as if we're okay. I know there have been some reports of uh, making our own swabs, uh, et cetera, but I believe certainly uh, in, in the inpatient setting, um, the, we're, we're holding our own. It's not ideal, but we have sufficient numbers. In terms of the mobile testing sites, I, I don't know and, and would welcome someone chiming in um, if they know uh, firsthand. If anybody does have that comment, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. You know, while, while we're just giving them that time, there there have also been some examples of mobile units being set up and great capacity, and then nobody shows up. So uh, in some parts of the country, not not here. So again, we have this coordination problem. Um, and you know, from a public health perspective, our our healthcare system is not amenable to the kind of coordinated responses that we need here. We have a a, a patchwork healthcare system um, with with different hospitals, uh, different you know private labs, state labs. Uh, th there are problems with getting all of this coordinated and avoiding duplication of cases and getting it rapidly reported. Yeah, and I would just add about the swabs. It the problem is it just can't be a cotton swab, you know, a Q-tip. It has to to really be a specific um, um, synthetic. Um, swab because if you use cotton you know sort of the, the virus glums on and and it really is uh, you get uh, results that aren't um, accurate I do not know the situation and please someone else comment on the drive-through testing sites availability of, of uh, testing materials I've not heard that there is uh, been a recent uh, problem with that but I am I, I don't know this is Lisa Costello. I'll try to chime in. I'm currently working with the Bureau for Public Health. Certainly test swab and all of the components that impact the test. People talk about test kits. They don't just come in one cute COVID testing kit. There's different components depending upon the different types. And so the FDA did expand the types of swabs that were approved to be used to collect specimens that did broaden the opportunity that it basically opened up more types of swabs you could use. I'm looking for that link that I'll try to get in the comments or give to the ECHO team to share in follow-up emails. Um, but I do think it's variable, and I know that testing sites communicate with our uh, Center for Threat Preparedness to determine and, and try to acquire swabs as long as well as contacting their local health department. So I do think it's variable, as Dr. Martin said. I think it's variable as how much of the remote sites are being utilized. Some of that might be people don't know where they're located, which we're trying to get better at getting that information out, or they may just not be going there to get tested. So we don't have a great, great, uh, I guess, handle on that because it, I think it's variable depending upon the use of those individual sites, but that, that it has been a challenge. The state team has been literally scouring the globe to try to find additional testing supplies that they can can get. As you could imagine, every person is trying to do this, but we have been making uh, some progress and people have been getting creative in where you could find them, places that we haven't thought previously, like uh, veterinarians' offices that are pretty much closed down. They would perhaps have a reserve of swabs that would be appropriate to be used and then you could acquire that supply. So sometimes reaching out in your community level to some of those places we would not probably typically think of using can help increase your individual supplies. Hopefully that hit on it a little bit, not probably a comprehensive answer, but um, that's what I can report from the state. That's perfect, we appreciate it. Um, we are almost out of time, but we have two more questions. Um, so one of the questions is that some sites have been using a finger stick test that has rapid results in 10 minutes. Is this accurate? Is this an accurate test? Uh, I'm not familiar with that specific test, but I, I can state that generally speaking, point of contact testing um, it, it is not validated yet in the clinical setting. Um, so that a lot of these are available through the FDA's emergency use authorization, but I think there are some concerns that we may be loosened up a little bit too much and a lot of tests that are getting out there um, have validity concerns. But I'm not familiar with that specific test. 
Great. Thank you. If we have any more information about that, we can send that out, definitely. Um, and then finally, uh, Dr. Karshinas, if you want to unmute yourself, you had a really excellent question that I don't think I could deliver as eloquently as you, if you would like to. Yeah, sure. Uh, Chris, uh, awesome job as always. Uh, thank you so much. I think the question that I wanted to see if you could shed some extra light on it uh, is that at this point in time, the FDA's emergency use authorization is really uh, recommending the use of at least one target sequence in the cocktail, if not three. Uh, but unfortunately, we have seen quite a bit of discrepancies between the RT-PCRs around the world where the World Health Organization has published extensively around the discrepancies between these labs that are doing RT-PCR testing in terms of their false positivity and false negativities relative to the number of uh, target probes they are using in the PCR reaction. So I wanted to see what your thoughts are relative to, even though PCR is used as a gold standard, it seems to have its own share of problems from lab to lab as, as these data are being published globally. Yeah, I, I don't have any uh, specific knowledge on uh, sequence related issues. Uh, but again, uh, we are uh, flying on the seat of our pants here. So there's a lot of issues as we move along uh, in terms of specimen collection, uh, what these test results mean, et cetera. Uh, but I don't have any specific knowledge on uh, specific technical concerns related to the uh, genetic sequence probe that's used. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in on that one. I don't see any takers. <laughs> you, you can tell us, Ali, for the next echo. <laughs> no, that, nice job. Great job, Chris. Proud of you. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you all. Um, I am so pleased to have gotten through our queue of questions. That was really building up, and I'm glad that we got to address all of that. Dr. Martin, thank you so much again. I hope you get to read some of the chats that were, that were really hyping you up and thankful for you being here. Um, a couple of, of announcements for next time. Uh, we're hoping to have a pulmonologist talk about some of the respiratory um, issues around COVID. So we will let you know in that reminder email. Look for that on Tuesday. We will be extending this series into May. Right now we're, we're certain we'll do the first week of May and we will continue as this situation evolves. So um, if you guys have any more questions, obviously you're welcome to chat them in, but you are also welcome to email Mitra or myself and we'll get them on the queue. Um, also, we ha uh, a lot of the team over at the CTSI have created a web page for these Q&As. So any questions that you're interested in or um, that were addressed in the last point, we have answers to them on a page um, and we will send you that link in the recap email. But that is it for us and thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see you all and everybody have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.